This is Everyday Spirituality from Connect.Faith. I'm Brian Barton. I'm here with David Lamont. David is an award-winning songwriter, speaker, and writer. David has been a professional musician for 30 years, published three books, and is a frequent keynote speaker. Welcome to Everyday Spirituality. Such a treat to be with you, Brian. So I was wondering if we could start with you telling me just a little bit about yourself. <laughs> um, uh, we'll see if that's possible or not. I might, I might just be <laughs> long-winded um, telling you just a little bit about myself. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, I, I have been a professional musician for almost 30 years, and I've, um, I've had the extraordinary privilege of getting to create things and share them with people as my work whether that's a book or a poem or a song or an idea or a set of ideas that flow together. And um, I, I wake up every day grateful for that. I really do. Um, that's not to say that every day is all full of joy, but it's, I, I try to not forget what a privilege that is. My mom listened many years ago to an NPR story where they were interviewing a, a researcher who had studied um, sort of the dream of being a, a professional musician and how many people get to do that. And the number that that researcher came up with was that of, of every 500 people that actually set out to try to do that, one wow. gets to do it. Wow. So I'm the guy whose dream came true, and I try to not take that for granted. Mm. I'm really grateful. That's amazing. It is amazing, and it's... And it, it's amazing for lots of reasons, um, including the fact that I'm, I know extraordinarily talented people who don't make a living doing this and would like to, but I have had various opportunities and, and some really good luck. You know, when people say life is like chess, it's, you, you strategize, I say, no, life is like backgammon. There are dice involved. And so sure i work hard and lots of other people work hard too and i also got some really good dice so i'm grateful and i bet that that view on life informs the the way that you do peacemaking and and view justice <laughs> as well yeah well if we're going to talk about peacemaking then life isn't backgammon at all right it's not <laughs> adversarial it's more like hacky sack where we all win when you keep the thing in the air right together um a much better metaphor <laughs> actually <laughs> so um yeah i i, I do um, I do think it is important, though, in any kind of justice work to be conscious of your social location mm -hmm. and to learn about that, especially if you're a person who carries some privilege, which I certainly am. I got dealt a lot of those cards to learn from people who don't carry particular forms of privilege that you're in conversation about, because it's a lot easier to see what's going on from the edge. It's really hard to see what's going on from the middle. And if you are the kind of person who's who's centered by your society, male voices are amplified more than female voices are, white voices are amplified more, straight voices are amplified more, cisgendered, um, Christian voices are amplified more. Um, and, and I think some Christians contest that a little bit because they see the privilege eroding somewhat. But if you wanna know where power lies, I think the easiest thing to do in the United States is to look at the makeup of our congressional bodies, right? Right, right. That's a lot of white men Christians, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's important to name that one as well among the forms of privilege that, that I'm carrying. And n none of that makes me either a good person nor a bad person, right. but it makes me somewhat ignorant in all honesty, right? That's the thing you gotta be careful with, with privilege, one thing. Um, I, I don't get to choose different cards. Those are the cards I was dealt. Mm -hmm. And I don't get to make other choices whether I would or not. Um, nobody asked me what skin I wanted to be born in. But given that I'm here, I have to now decide what I'm gonna do with this. I've been given more power than I deserve. So the question is, what do you do with that power, for one thing? And the other question is, how do you subvert the systems that gave it to you. <laughs> right. And, and the third question is, how do you learn about who you are from other people who can teach you? Who have a different perspective. Right. Yeah. Who have perspectives that I may not have. Right. Right. And I, I'm sure there are other questions too, but those are the ones I'm wrestling with right. at this particular point of my journey. And so when you think about world changing, you talk a lot about the role not of any individual 
whether the privilege comes into that or not, but the role of how a lot of individuals need to come together to actually make the change. Yeah. So the whole phrase world changing, I, I kind of squish it together into one word, but the, that whole concept sounds ludicrous mm -hmm. to most people. Like mm -hmm. it sounds um, naive and um, audacious, right? right? So, so I think it bears a little bit of explanation of what exactly I mean when I say that. Um, for one thing, the world is really big, but it's made up of small places like this one right here. And as you and I change each other through our interaction, we will be changed by knowing each other. Guaranteed, I will be changed by knowing you and vice versa, because that's how it works in, um, in uh, oh, what do they call that? Um, when, uh, you know, criminal scientists that gather, the word is escaping me at the moment, um, they gather data from crime scenes. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that? Called? Forensics. Forensics. That's it. In the science of forensics, there's this law that they say every contact leaves a trace, mm -hmm. and I think that's absolutely true mm -hmm. for us as human beings. Everybody we interact with changes a little bit. So, this is a part of the world. If we've changed this, mm -hmm. we have changed We're doing the world. Work to change right? the world. Right? That is changing the world. I think it's very important for us to remember that what makes the change is that small, undramatic, consistent effort mm. over time. And there's good news there, which is that you are not powerless, right? We can show up and do the work. We don't have to be Superman right. to show up and do the work. The work that really moves it forward is that undramatic work of showing up, gathering together in a group, making sure the people are in the room who have the biggest stake in this and have uh, things to say about it, and then deciding together what we're gonna do, who's gonna do which part, when we're gonna do it, when we're gonna meet up again to make sure we did it and figure out what to do next, right? It's, it, I hate to say it, it breaks my heart, you know, having grown up in the Presbyterian church, but what changes the world is committees, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it, 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 people gathering together to figure out what right. needs to be done and how we're gonna do it. That's how we change the world. And that's good news, because it mm. means we are not powerless. So where, where do you see a movement happening now? Is there, if people are looking to get involved in this kind of work? Yeah, I, I see so many. I'm really excited about the Poor People's Campaign. Um, I, am a, I really believe in Reverend Barber who, and, and Liz Theo Harris who are leading that. They are both extraordinary people. I don't know Reverend Theo Harris personally, but I know Reverend Barber quite well. We've been arrested together um, and hung out in a jail cell <laughs> so um, been through some stuff and I've been in backroom meetings with him where everybody was kicked out that wasn't in it and I've been on big stages with him and I've he's the same person the whole mm. time he means what he is saying and he's a bright light and a brilliant strategist and a and a rich deep theologian who is really having an impact I, I strongly recommend that people check out the poor people's campaign but beyond that I see little movements happening all over the place in small towns um, where people are just, they see an issue, they find out about something or it lands in their doorstep and they decide to show up and gather together in a room without knowing what the plan is until they gather, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And what, right? What are we gonna do about this? Right. Um, we've had a thrilling um, and difficult experiment with that in my own hometown in recent months um, I learned more in the last year about an issue that I'd been somewhat aware of, but in terms of um, asylum seekers uh, in the United States right now who are being imprisoned for the crime of asking for help, oh. right? We have laws, domestic and international treaties that we are committed to, which then take on the force of domestic law by our, by our own constitution. Um, we, uh, we have laws that we are committed to that require us to take care of people when they come to our borders and say, I'm running for my life. If that appears to be a credible story, um, we are obligated to look out for them. Instead, we're putting them in uh, for-profit detention centers. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about stories I read in the paper. I'm talking about my friends have told me stories about being in the Yelera, which is the, the ice box, the, um, 
being detained there in a room with 20 people sleeping on concrete floors with nothing but an aluminum foil, you know, those foil space blankets yeah. with an exposed toilet in the middle of the room that everybody uses, right? And I'm talking about children that went through that. So communities across the country are gathering to sponsor families or individuals. Most people in detention right now are uh, adult males who need a place to be. But sometimes, as with our community, there's a family that needs help. And there's a mom and four uh, kids who have come to our little town three weeks ago um, mm -hmm. and are now with us. And, and, and Brian, it wasn't that hard to find our way forward. There's a lot of work to be done, but there's a lot of us, right? <laughs> right. So I put the word out um, through s to some people that I knew. I didn't throw it up on Facebook. I didn't mm -hmm. want to stir up folks who don't think this is a good idea. I didn't want to spend my energy that way. I want to spend my energy caring for this family and finding our way forward together. So I put the word out to some folks. 55 people showed up on, at 3 o'clock on a Sunday um, in the middle of November to have a conversation. And I had invited them to say, let me tell you about this issue. And then let's see if we have the resources together mm -hmm. as a community to help somebody out. And so 55 people showed up, which was thrilling. And what we did, we gathered the, the chairs in a horseshoe and we spent about 45 minutes just educating people about the issue. And then we had little uh, four top tables around the room with a big piece of paper on each one with in magic marker written a thing like medical or education or um, uh, hospitality. And, and I in told people about these nine different topic areas. We need to get folks some food and make sure that the place they're going to stay is going to be okay. We need a place to stay. That's one right. of the topics. Um, we need transportation. Transportation, right. We need a transportation crew. We need a translation crew. Mm -hmm. So I asked everybody in the room to go and so self-sort themselves. So we asked people, look, if you have a particular gift or a particular passion for one of these topic areas, please go there put your name on that piece of paper and then let's take 25 minutes and y'all talk amongst yourselves mm -hmm. in your teams about what resources you can bring, what ideas you have and what questions you have. And then we gathered back together and we spent about 20 minutes, everybody given a quick team report. Here are our questions. Here's what we think we can do. We had a fundraising team. We had all the, mm -hmm. all the different teams. Um, and they all came back together. And at the end of two hours, we had a place to stay for a family mm -hmm. with, um, a double bed and three single beds, um, excuse me, four single beds. So we had enough room for this whole family. Um, we had uh, a whole team of translators, a whole team of transport people. We had some folks who were willing to try to uh, wrangle the legal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, on and on and on. All these slots were filled by people who showed up and said, yeah, I can help with that. Yeah, that's, that's not cool. We need to do better than this. Right. Um, how about if we do better than this right. <laughs> together? No, nobody going down to the border, the detention facility with a, you know, blowtorch trying to. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, and, and we also have people in the community that are going down to the detention facilities sure. and are protesting in front mm -hmm. of them and are doing that work as well, right. which is also important work. Right. And I don't want to minimize that half of it. I think. I think activism has two halves, mm -hmm. and they're both really important. Mm -hmm. One is protest. One is standing in the way of what's wrong. Right. But the other is creating what's right, right, creating parallel systems, and finding ways to address these needs in the moment and, and model this. Mm -hmm. right? So yes. I think it is important to distinguish between peacemaking and conflict avoidance. These are not the same things, mm -hmm. right? And I, I was mentioning to you earlier um, that my dad taught me years ago. My dad is one of those really smart guys that speaks a lot of languages, including Latin and ancient Greek. And he's, he instilled in me a love for etymology. I find it really fascinating where words come from. And he pointed out to me many years ago that the word pacifism, the word pacifist, and the word passive have no root words in common. None. So it is an accident of semantics and or of, of linguistic history that these two words sound anything alike. They have nothing to do with each other. But I think the popular understanding of pacifism is 
what you don't do, mm-hmm. right? You don't go to war. You don't use violence. And in fact, that's not what it means. The word pacifist comes from pax, peace, and ficare, which is the fundamental action verb of Latin. It's like hacer in Spanish or fair in French. It is the fundamental action verb, right? So that's what pacifism is. It's peacemaking or peace doing. Whereas passive comes from passus, which means to suffer or to endure. And suffer is generally what you do if you don't react to people who are abusing you, right? Right. So you literally can't be passive and be a pacifist. Mm. The two terms are mutually exclusive. If you were going to be doing and making peace, you can't just suffer and And endure, endure. Mm. right? You got to show up and do the work Mm -hmm. in the rhythm of, of the work. That's great. I want to thank you for joining us uh, at connect.faith. If people want to find out more about you, where could they, where could they look? Easiest place to go is davidlamott.com. And the only trick with that is you have to know how to spell Lamott. Um, It doesn't have an N in it. It's L-A-M-O-T-T-E. So davidlamott.com will take you there. And that will introduce people to my Patreon community, which is kind of my innermost public circle these Mm -hmm. days. It's right there at the top. You can click through if you want to know more about that. Um, and it'll take you to Abraham Jam and Let's Be Neighbors and all the different things I do. So thanks so much for your hospitality. Brian. Absolutely. Thanks, really, for, thanks for joining us. Really a joy. Excellent. This has been Everyday Spirituality from Connect.Faith. You can find out more about us on our website, Connect.Faith, and we will see you next time.